Happy Wednesday. Hope your day's going well. Hope your week is going well. Hope Mount Hood is treating you well. If it's not, let me know. I'm really glad to have you here. It was fun seeing you in lab and stuff on Monday. And of course, if you have any questions on anything, uh, please let me know. I just want to make a reminder that next Monday at 1.10 p.m., uh, some stuff will be due for you. Nothing is due until, though, Monday at 1.10 p.m. too. So next Monday for lab at 1.10 in this room, we'll turn in the eight bottles lab, first of all. Actually, unless you've turned it in already. Uh, problem set number one is up. And what I'd like for you to do on that is just try the problems ahead of time. Come in. If they're not totally fine, it's okay because we're going to be self-correcting our work. So if you miss number five, it's okay. Just cross it out, put in at least the right answer. Hopefully some stuff's how you can correct it the next time. And when you turn it in, you get full credit. All right, it's no problem. Uh, we'll take quiz number one after that. Quiz number one, like all quizzes, is gonna be a show your work quiz, about 30 minutes long. You definitely can have a periodic table. You definitely can also have a page of your handwritten notes. So if you want to bring that in, that's totally cool. Staple your notes to the back of the quiz if you do use them, uh, but that's totally awesome. And you will get all of that back in the following week. And then after we do the quiz, we'll go up to 2507 again. We'll do the density lab. Density is more of a true like science lab or measurements and all that jazz. Make sure you bring a printed copy of the lab. Make sure it is the in-class version of the density lab too. Most of our labs, there's an in-class version and an online version. Online is for section W1 because I don't see them. In class is for you in this class as you'll actually be doing stuff. So um, there's a sample quiz in the companion and on the website. The sample quiz does have the answers. You can kind of see what a quiz is like. It was a quiz I gave out a few years ago. Questions? Uh, yeah. yeah uh, do you know if there's a printer in the library? There's, yes. there's, there's two printers at least. Thank you. Yeah, they just they charge your student account. Thank you. I tell people usually to go to 1451, the student area, but honestly, the library, that's good to know too. Uh, yeah, so excellent question. That's a good thing to make sure you figure out. Other questions? All right. Uh, we talked on Monday about how atoms are really, really small and really, really numerous. So many of them. You put a little bit of water down the drain, you just put more molecules of water down the drain, and there are teaspoons in the Atlantic Ocean, these kind of things that I babble about. So chemists need ways to represent not only what kind of matter we have, but also how much matter we have. Um, this is an example of gold versus mercury. Now, when we look at it with our eyes, gold and mercury look quite different. Like at room temperature, mercury is a liquid. Quicksilver is the name that sometimes is used. On the other hand, gold is solid. It's made with jewelry and stuff like that. However, on the atomic level, and these are pictures on the atomic level, and we'll talk about this more in Chem 222, why they look this way, et cetera, et cetera. But on the atomic level, gold and mercury actually look the same. So I bring up this slide because our world, which I will call macroscopic, the world of us and remote controls and cell phones and stuff like that, is sometimes a lot different than the world of the atomic atoms, like how the atoms go together. All right. So in chemistry, we have to use lots of symbolism to represent what's happening. We represent symbols to see if it's mercury or gold. We also need symbols to represent how much of something is going around, stuff like that. Um, if you hear macroscopic, though, it just means the world that you and I live in, all right, the things we're used to seeing. And a lot of times on the atomic world, things are quite different. Balloon filled with hydrogen and surrounded by air represents a potential chemical reaction. To initiate the reaction, we need to ignite the balloon. The hydrogen will combine with oxygen in the air to form water in gaseous form, releasing considerable energy in the process. At the molecular scale, the molecules of gaseous hydrogen, H2, and oxygen, O2, combine to produce H2O, water generating heat and light. So this is an example of how these different uh, modes of looking at things will really make a difference. In our world, what happened is we took a balloon filled with hydrogen gas, lit it on fire, some kind of a spark, and bam, 
the hydrogen inside, represented by white molecules, reacted with the oxygen, represented in red molecules, on the outside. And when all is said and done, water, H2O, was being made. So what we see is a balloon, light it on fire, bam! Oh, cool for birthdays or whatever. But anyway, on the molecular level, it's a lot more interesting, though, because first of all, these are both gases, all right? And so that's what the G represents. And in this form, water comes out as a gas as well. So the G's right there, and with, there's other symbols that can go there too, represent something about the phase, what it looks like. Is it a solid? Is it a liquid? Is it a gas? And these are all gases. Also notice here that we need two hydrogens for every one oxygen. That's what that two means right there. And if you have one part oxygen and two parts hydrogen, you end up making two parts water as well. So this is what we use in symbolism in chemistry to represent reactions. Um, on Monday, I talked about how chemistry is like a language, all right? Well, here we're using some letters, which are the atoms, H and O. The H's and O make compounds, combinations, like this is a, a word, if you will. These are words. And this thing right here is like a sentence because it shows what you start with and what you end with. Information is transferred in this, just like as I tell you, you know, these things, you're learning materials as well, at least hopefully. <laughs> so anyway, symbolism is really important. And we'll go into all this and stuff more in the, in the future, but I wanted to represent what's happening. This is an atomic representation. Again, you've got the individual atoms before, the molecules of water afterwards. So that's one thing that makes chemistry kind of unique, all right? We've got all these different ways to represent just a simple transformation of things into water in this case. <clears throat> now, this leads us more into why there's different phases of matter. And uh, this is important because uh, also on Monday I talked about how, you know, you can have ice, which is solid water. You can drink liquid water, of course. Woohoo! And of course, if you're putting things on a heater or something, the steam comes off. That's uh, gaseous water. And all of those are H2O, all right? But the difference between solids, liquids, and gases is how the individual pieces connect with each other. So let's talk about these solids, liquids, and gases and what's going on with them. Solids, all the molecules are very, very close to each other. So this is an example of solid bromine. Now, bromine is really noxious. You don't want to smell it. <clears throat> you certainly don't want to eat it or anything like that. But it can be in a solid state, like right here. <clears throat> And when you have solid bromine, just really compact, really tightly under, really tight to each other. Um, solids, like ice cubes, like pieces of metal, have usually a pretty fixed shape. And it's kind of rigid, but it's usually pretty fixed. Volume certainly fixed, all right? If you have 10 milliliters of, of iron, it'll be that way. And actually, scientists understand solids pretty well. And we'll talk about solids a lot in Chem 222. Now, liquids are super important, of course, for drinking water, milk, power drinks, coffee. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I won't need to go there. Liquids are really interesting, though. Uh, they're not as tightly connected. So if you look in this little picture right here, like here, there's hardly any gaps between the bromines. But here, there's, there's definitely gaps, all right? So liquids have space between the molecules, but they're still connected. So that's why when you pour liquids out, they'll like go over what kind of container they are. They don't have fixed shape. They probably won't fill containers completely. All right, you'll have more at the bottom than at the top. Believe it or not, liquids are pretty tough to understand scientifically. Uh, we'll look at this more in Chem 222 as well. But uh, liquids, which are all around us, of course, are uh, harder to explain in terms of math. The hardest to understand, or to, hardest to see and control, are actually the easiest phase uh, to understand mathematically, and that's gases. Now think about gases for a minute. Let's say I had in my hand some argon, and I said, hey, look at my argon, and I opened my hand, the gas is gone, all right? Gases are just really hard to contain. But amazingly, gases are pretty well understood theoretically. The math is pretty straightforward. You will argue in Chem 222 that our chemistry started with the study of gases, which is crazy. 
Um, this is an example of bromine as a gas. This little stuff over this container here is actually gaseous bromine. And notice the space between the molecules, all right? Pretty distinct. So there's hardly any movement, any space between the molecules here, lots of space between them here, and kind of medium in between. Now, I'm just going to tease you about this. We're going to talk in Chem 222 about a fourth state of matter. So there's a fourth state in addition to solids, liquids, and gases, and it's called plasma. And if you look at the universe, plasma is the most abundant phase. Now, if you look around here, all right, solids, mostly solid, <laughs> uh, liquids, obviously, we're breathing gas, no plasma. Plasma is really high energy, man. But plasma is the source of the sun. And there's a lot of solar e events and stuff in the universe. All of the suns uh, and stuff like that, as well as lightning, other things, actually made up of plasma. So plasma is not something we're used to seeing in our macroscopic world, but in the universe, it's the most abundant of all the phases. We'll talk more about plasma later, but it's pretty cool. Questions? All right. According to the kinetic molecular theory, the molecules of a solid are locked in place, though they have motion. Molecules of a liquid are closely associated with each other, but move relative to one another. Molecules of a gas move independently and occupy a much larger volume than those of a corresponding liquid or solid. The kinetic molecular theory is what scientists use to understand the differences between solids, liquids, and gas. And the KMT, because we're going to use it a lot, the KMT uh, shows you in this little video the differences. So solids super close to each other. Uh, liquids has some space between them, but they are connected. That's why you pour, the liquids kind of stay together. On the other hand, gases, no control. This molecule can care less about that molecule. Over here, this molecule is very tightly connected to this molecule. As long as you're above zero Kelvin, there'll be some movement over here. These have tons of movement. So the KMT is just something we'll go through and stuff as we go through the different parts of this quarter. But you can think back to this as, as to why ice, liquid, solid water, is different from liquid water and why steam, gaseous water, is different from liquid water. Why, you have the most important job of all. You'll be our test monkey. Test monkey? <laughs> I need three volunteers at this point to very well, like, cinch down the differences between solids, liquids, and gases. The three volunteers will have to be up here in front of the camera. Does anybody want to volunteer? One, thank you. Two, three, fine. Either one of you. Actually, all four of you. Come, come down. Yeah, all of you come down. I'm honored to have you all here, guys. All right. So this is going to be the cheesy example, but hopefully make you remember of how solids, liquids, and gases are different. If you would all four kind of line up in a row. All right. Yeah. All right. Sweet. Now, all right, you got to move this way just a little bit because, Daniel, you're not in the video, man. I want you there. <laughs> Thank you. All right. This is an example of a solid. We're going to start at zero Kelvin. They're not moving at all. All right. Now we're going to start raising the temperature with my proverbial magic wand. I left the actual one at home. Sorry about that. Darn it. Move forward one step. Move backward one step. Perfect. All right. Good. Yeah. Everybody's doing it. Yeah. You can keep that's cool. This is a solid. All right. Very tightly controlled, all right? Now, normally, if we look at like your computer, we don't see these atoms moving around in there, but on the atomic level, you do, all right? Only at zero Kelvin will they be totally still and stuff, so that's it. All right, now we're gonna turn the solids of students into a liquid of students, all right? So I'm gonna do my magic wand again. Now, using this same volume, kind of like move around a little bit. Like, yeah, go forward, backward. Yeah, this is fine. Go, yeah, move it. You can change positions, you know, like, yeah. There, yeah, Rory, thank you. Got it there. Yeah, it's kind of like a, a nerdy dance, all right? Well, with the chemistry. This is a liquid, all right? They're all kind of connected there, but it's a little bit more chaotic. And this is why it's hard to understand as a theoretical mathematician-like person how to describe it, right? It's all over the place. Liquids are tough to understand. You need higher level math to figure out, you know, things that move and stuff. All right, my final thing. 
things. I'm going to take my magic wand. We're going to raise the uh, liquid of students <laughs> to a gas of students. So, <laughs> and now everybody go to your spot. <laughs> Excellent. This is a guess. There's no interaction, stuff like that. Everybody kind of goes random directions and random times. This is what makes solid. A gas is gases. Now, arguably, if they were true gases, they'd occupy this room, you know, and evenly and stuff, but it's all right. Please help me in joining, giving a round of applause to our fellow volunteers, because I really do appreciate it. Silly and very stupid, I know, but hopefully it gives you a better sense. So, Any questions? Okay, the important thing I want to highlight again and again and again, H2O is water. And you got a piece of ice, drinking liquid water, sniffing the steam, it's all H2O, all right? The difference is, is how those water molecules are connected to each other. So if you've got ice, they're really tight, liquid's kind of doing a dance there, all right? And the gases, they just go all over the place. All right. Now, to turn a solid to a liquid, liquid to gas, or gas to solid, any of these directions are possible. Most people don't have a magic wand. So anyway, what people do instead of using magic wand is they'll use energy, all right? Heat, energy, sometimes electrical, but most of the time it's heat and stuff like that. And some transitions are easier to make happen than others. So scientists and chemists definitely are really interested in how much energy it takes to convert a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas, stuff like that. <clears throat> I'm going to introduce two terms here we're going to use all throughout Chem 221 through Chem 223. And those are endothermic and exothermic. And if you haven't heard these terms before, make sure you kind of know slash memorize them. Endo means it goes inside. Endothermic means it needs energy to make that happen. And anytime you go from a solid to a liquid, a liquid to a gas, or even a solid to a gas, always endothermic. It always is going to take energy. So you have to heat it up. You have to, you can use electricity sometimes or magnetism. Most of the time it's heating up and stuff. Anytime you're going to make that happen, it's going to take energy. Conversely, if you go from a gas to a liquid, a liquid to a solid, or even sometimes gases directly to solids, those are exothermic. Exo means to release. Energy is being released. So you're going to get energy out if you turn a gas into a liquid, liquids to solids, etc., etc. So exothermic means to release energy. Endothermic means to absorb energy. Sometimes you'll see diagrams that look like this. Almost always in physical science, the y-axis here is an energy axis. So if you go from a solid at the bottom to a gas on the top, solid to gas, it's going to take energy. It's going to be a positive increase on the wine. That means a positive energy. It takes energy to make it happen. But, excuse me, if you go from that same gas back to a liquid, now you're going down on the Y scale. That means energy is released. Those are going to be negative values. You're going to get the energy coming out of the system. So actually making solids, you end up getting energy out. Turning solids into liquids, liquids into gas, you have to add energy in. All right. So we'll talk a lot more about endothermic and exothermic coming up. Just realize that exothermic, you get energy out. Endothermic, you're going to need energy to come in. Yes. Heard this term taking physics last year. Uh -huh. Isothermic means no temperature change. Cool. That's right. Isothermic means you don't have any energy change whatsoever. And that is a cool term to know. Uh, in our class, we're mostly concerned with uh, positive or negative, endo, exo kind of things. But yeah, isothermic would be no energy change. Excellent. Excellent comment. Yeah. You said um, endo was positive and exo was negative. That's correct. There's actually values that go along with endo and exo. And when we'll talk about joules uh, in chapter uh, five, uh, endothermic would be a positive number for joules, and exothermic will be a negative number for joules. Good. This is something like we will talk about later, but it's going to be a few chapters and stuff. I like to foreshadow as your instructor, all right? I like to give you teasers about things we're going to talk about. I hope in the back of your mind you're like, hmm, exothermic, endothermic. And then when we get to it, it kind of makes more sense. Instructor tricks, one of 
Thanks. Other questions? <clears throat> Sometimes scientists talk about physical versus chemical properties, so I want to talk about that just real fast. Um, this is really important to groups that do, for example, like crime scene analysis. Um, it also is helpful if you're analyzing uh, samples that come from something you've created or an environmental source. A physical property, a physical reaction, is something that can be observed and measured, but you don't destroy or hurt the sample. You don't change the composition of the subject, of the substance you're looking at. So for example, you can look at a substance and say, oh, it's red. That hasn't changed the substance. So color is an example of a physical property. Um, making something melt and boil also is a physical property. If you make something boil and you collect the gas, you can make it recondense back to a liquid, for example. Odor is another one, although I don't recommend using that one, of course, in chemistry. A physical change, then, is when you're looking at the physical property of something, but something's happening. So if you take a liquid and turn it into a gas, that would, boiling would be a physical property. Melting of a solid would be another one. Um, another one we'll talk about in a future uh, chapter is making a solution. Now, solids, liquids, and gases are kind of really, are obviously important. Solutions, though, are where the action usually is in chemistry. And in a solution, you have some kind of substance you're dissolving in another substance. So as an example, my beloved coffee is a solution, all right? You're taking the essence of the coffee bean, water, it's all being dissolved in water, all right? So you have something that's exciting, and you have also then like a bulk, and the water would be the uh, bulk in the solution. We will certainly talk about solutions more uh, in a little, in a while, but solution, making a solution is almost always a physical change. Now, here's an example. If you have an eye clicker, you can use it. If you don't, don't worry about it. You can just think about what the answer is, write it down on a piece of paper, and test yourself. And as a reminder, if you push the eye clicker and you push the wrong button, the wrong answer, it's no big deal. This is all just about participation, hopefully keeping you from you know, falling asleep at my dumb jokes. Anyway, which of the following is not a physical change? Now, a physical change means that it's reversible, all right? You can get back to the original say freezing making a liquid forming in a solid is definitely reversible all right you can take liquid water for example freeze it into ice cubes you can remelt it in a thing that would be a physical change so that's not this answer right here um, dissolving a solid in a water to form a solution we talked about nope that's almost always physical because you can evaporate the water say and get the solid back Evaporation, liquid into steam, that's reversible, collect the steam. Um, burning a piece of paper. So let's say you're like, oh, Russell, your syllabus sucks, and you start burning it. All right, they're like, oh my gosh, maybe I actually need that later on, or something like that. Is it easy to get the syllabus back after it's been burned? No, oh, right, I should just give you another copy or you could print one yourself or something like that, right? Yeah, that's not going to be easy to do. So burning is a chemical property. That's not a physical property. You would have difficulty getting that burned piece of paper stuff back to the syllabus. I don't think it's possible. It would be very, very, very difficult. Uh, yeah, so burning is an example of something that's not reversible. That would not be a physical change because physical changes are reversible. Reversible. This last one, I'm introducing the word sublimation. Sublimation is when you take a uh, solid and turn it into a gas. And it is something that happens in chemistry. Um, the best real world analogy, if you've ever used dry ice, which you can buy at Fred Meyers, it's dry ice is kind of fun, but if you place it in a liquid, it makes like a steam kind of stuff over it. That's actually solid carbon dioxide. That's what dry ice is being turned into gaseous carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide sublimates, uh, turns directly from a solid into a gas, and it does happen for substances. We'll talk about that more in Chem 222. But that's also reversible, so it's a physical thing. Questions? 
chemical changes, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to have it reversed, all right? These are more or less one way. Now, sometimes even in chemical changes, you can make it reverse, but it's very difficult, all right? Like I would say burning the syllabus, that would be impossible to go back. We can turn water back to hydrogen and oxygen if you add electricity, for example, but it takes a lot more energy than if you just uh, turn the hydrogen and oxygen into water. So think about chemical changes as being properties that are hard to reverse, all right? Basically a one directional kind of thing. Um, magnetism is another example of a physical property. Uh, some substances are magnetic. They will attract themselves to other magnets. Uh, we'll talk about magnets this quarter a little bit, which is kind of fun. On the other hand, here's the poor coyote and the roadrunner uh, <laughs> blowing himself up. Uh, that's probably not reversible, but it's kind of fun to think about. Anyway, well, fun in a sick way. Sorry about that. Anyway, chemical properties are things that would be hard to go back. And if you burn things or explosions and stuff like that, uh, that's, that's going to be pretty difficult to go back. Now, if you're interested in measuring, say, how magnetic something is, or if you want to know how much energy you're going to get out from burning something, you're going to need units to represent how much stuff you have. And that's where we start getting into measuring out how much of things there are. Now, <clears throat> physical properties especially, you've got to have temperatures, you have to have uh, density values, how much mass there is per volume, uh, lots of things like that. And if you don't have good units, then uh, it can be kind of tough. So I've got these graphs up here of the world, <laughs> all right? And the top part, you can see almost everything is green. And the bottom part, woohoo, US of A, and uh, what other country over here, Sri Lanka or whatever, um, and oh, there's one in Africa right there too, actually. Uh, those countries are in red. Green countries are the countries that have formally adopted the metric system. And the metric system is, oh, so much easier to understand when you're measuring quantities. You can convert from places to places. Um, the red countries here uh, use sometimes what's called the imperial system. I'll sometimes refer to it as the American system. And um, the units aren't integrals of 10, so calculators are certainly important. Now, I was born in Gresham, Oregon, and grew up around here, so I'm used to temperatures and Fahrenheit and how many miles it is for me to go from one place to the other, blah, blah, blah. So in my personal world, I do use the American system. But as a scientist, oh, I'm embarrassed because metric system is so cool. It's so much easier to quickly convert things from one to the other. Um, these are examples of lengths right here in this little picture. Here's kilometers, meters, centimeters, millimeters. And you can see up here, it's either multiply or divide by some factor of 10, all right? Down here, we've got what I was used to growing up, miles, yards, foots, inches, and man, none of these things are, are the same, right? Three is different than 12, which is different than this wild 1760 uh, thing. So I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how we got here, I'll be honest. But uh, as a scientist, using metric system is not optional, all right? We will use the metric system because it's just so much easier for converting things over. But again, we do live in the US of A, so we'll talk about how to convert from meters to feet and all this kind of stuff too. If you're a jazz fan, you'll appreciate this. If you are, it's okay. Here's Miles Davis, one of the greatest jazz musicians of all time. Here's Kilometer Davis, a mile is longer than a kilometer. All right, if you don't like jazz, then forget. All right, metric system. If you haven't dealt with it before, you're like, oh man, all right. So here's Sally from Peanuts, you know, centimeter, any come, centimeters come in this room, I'm gonna step on them. <laughs> and then you can just imagine a teacher going, wah, 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 you know, yes ma'am, because obviously it's cool and Sally is smoking. Anyway, here's this poor doofus. Uh, he brings his wife a metric, <laughs> uh, a metric thing of roses, which is 10, uh, probably just being cheap compared to regular dozen dope roses so anyway there's lots of jokes and stuff about metric system um, 
I'm going to assume that more or less you know how the metric system works. And like we went over briefly yesterday how it works. But let's say you are absolutely brand new to the metric system. I have some handouts and some guides and self quizzes online that you can use to kind of go through and figure out how metric system works. And if you do get stuck on anything, uh, let me know. You're, we're going to be more interested in converting from one metric version to another. I'm not going to be asking you normally how to go from one metric system to, say, feet, if it was a length thing. If you do have questions on it and stuff, let me know. This is a typical kind of question you might see. I'd like you to put these four lengths in order of increasing size. Now, let's say you didn't know anything about the metric system. Well, you'd think, well, this is the smallest number, this is the biggest number, stuff like that. But notice how they have different metric prefixes. And like I said uh, in lab on Monday, I really, really, really want you to know a couple of them, which includes the centa and the milla. Now, there's different ways to convert these, but 100 centimeters is one meter, and 1,000 millimeters is one meter. So if you look at these, these two are already in meters, but these two are not. So what I would do on a problem like this is I would first convert these two values into meters, and then you can compare which ones are bigger and which ones are smaller. So for example, nine centimeters, if you divide by 100 centimeters per meter, you'll get uh, 0 0.09 meters. So this is 0 0.09. This number is in millimeters, divided by 1,000, you'll get 0 0.215 meters, all right? So 0 0.09 is the smallest, that should go first. 0.125 is smaller than 0.215, which is what this one was, and then 2.3 meters is the largest. So that's kind of how you would do this kind of problem. Google will be able to convert these things for you if you put a Google query in, but in a quiz or exam, that may not be an option. So make sure that you know how to do it too. Any questions? Um, in lab the other day, uh, I said how there's five of them I'd really like you to know. And there's a whole bunch of these what they call metric prefixes. And they're super versatile. Now in terms of length, which means that the base will be a meter, we're seeing how these five metric prefixes work. Those five metric prefixes are kilo, centa, milla, micro, which gets that weird new kind of Greek symbol, and nano, all right? There's more than just these five, but in chemistry, these are the five we'll use a lot. Anytime you see kilo, the number that goes with it is 10 to the third, which is 1,000. So for example, in terms of meters, there's 1,000 10 to the third meters in a kilometer. That's what that means. Centa has 10 to the minus two in it. A centimeter is 10 to the minus 2 meters, and milla, 10 to the minus 3rd, nano, 10 to the minus 9, etc., etc. So if you had, for example, the oxygen-hydrogen distance, which I did show you on Monday afternoon, you can see how these different parts play out. Sometimes scientists don't want to write times 10 to the, you know, thing, so they'll use just a non-value uh, like that. There are uses for all these different pieces. Um, the kilometer is bigger than the base. These are all smaller, and that's why we'll use them a lot. Any questions on that? In your day-to-day -day world, you've probably dealt with a lot of other ones. So for example, on a computer, a terabyte, a gigabyte, a megabyte, those are all metric prefixes as well, the mega, tera, and uh, giga. And so giga means 10 to the ninth, et cetera, et cetera. There's also smaller ones. Um, we will look at picometers a little bit in Chem 222. Pico is 10 to the minus 12 and femto is 10 to the minus 15. So there's a lot of other ones around there, but if you understand how R5 work, then the other ones should fall into play pretty easily. So. Oh, those centimeters. All right. 
there's a lot of uses for metrics. <laughs> this poor sap. Oh, so thirsty and stuff like that. Well, here's water 50 meters. Here's water 9 kilometers. Well, 9 is smaller than 50, says the American who doesn't know anything about metrics. <laughs> oh, man. Kilometer is much longer than a meter. Kilometer is 1,000 meters. So, uh, so, yeah, so know your metrics. I have a weird sense of humor. This leads us into the idea of density. And density is going to be a real powerful tool that we're going to use a lot in chemistry. And to start off this discussion of density, I have to tell a joke. And yes, I know, I already need, I know I need to keep my day job, but this joke is so appropriate. There's an old joke, and it says, which weighs more, a ton of feathers or a ton of bricks? And people that don't know about density say, oh yeah, well, it's bricks, man, because bricks, wow, it's like solid, all right? Yeah, and feathers, you know, you can push your foot, you know, nothing to it, right? No problem. Well, the joke of the joke is that if you have a ton, you have the same amount, all right? It'll take a lot more feathers to make a ton than it takes to make a ton of bricks because bricks are more dense. So density just means mass per volume. So in a small amount of volume, like within my hand, all right, it's not gonna take a lot of brick and stuff to make that happen. On the other hand, a feather, there's not gonna be any mass at all. Now remember that mass is like weight, all right? Weight technically is part of gravity. We're not, physicists worry about this. In chemistry, we're just gonna consider mass and weight to be basically the same. But anyway, the mass per volume. So you make like a square, and these numbers represent how much mass will go inside there. So here's an example of good old gold versus dense, uh, mercury, all right? Gold has a bigger number than mercury does. So in a centimeter cube, which we'll talk about in a second, centimeter cube, you're gonna have 19.3 grams of gold versus 13.6 grams of mercury. So if this was a scale, the gold would weigh more, 19.3 grams in a centimeter cube versus mercury's 13.6 grams per centimeter cube. So all density is gonna have two units, a mass unit, it's usually grams on top, and a volume unit on the bottom. Now volume on the bottom is usually centimeters cubed or a milliliter. And big surprise, no uh, spoiler alert, a centimeter cubed and a milliliter are the same thing. Centimeter cubed means centimeter times centimeter times centimeter, length times width times height. And one centimeter cubed is equal to a milliliter, all right? So uh, Rory says, boy, I'm sick of using the superscript three. I'm gonna write milliliters, no problem, all right? You can interchange the two with no big deal. Milliliters are usually used for liquids and centimeters cubed are usually used for solids, but it doesn't matter, you can kind of figure it out. So I'm gonna show you a video here with I think it's Pepsi and Diet Pepsi. And believe it or not, they have different densities. First, the can of Pepsi is dropped into the water. Note that the can sinks. Now the can of Diet Pepsi is dropped into the water. Note that the can floats. What causes the difference in densities? Pepsi contains sugar and Diet Pepsi contains aspartame. Sugar solutions are more dense than aspartame solutions. So let's say you found a can and all the writing had been ripped off in the sand or something like that. And you weren't sure if it was diet or regular. And some people have preferences one way or the other. Well, in theory, if you put it in a big beaker of water, if it sank, it would be a sugar-based solution. And if it floated, it would be like an aspartame, NutraSweet kind of solution because those are less dense than water. Now, superposition is really important in density because most of the time that more dense objects go to the bottom and the less dense objects float to the top. So you can see in that video, water was like the medium part and the sugar solution was more dense than water, so it went to the bottom. On the other hand, the Diet Pepsi, which had the NutraSweet aspartame, that was less dense, so it floated on the top. 
And if you ever put like oil on water, all right, oils are almost always less dense than water. So they float on the top, they don't do very well. On the other hand, you take a, most rocks and you throw them in the water, all right, rocks are almost always more dense than water, so they sink to the bottom. That's the idea of superposition. Scientists use density to separate materials. Recycling of plastics uh, is one way. Plastics have different densities, so you can separate the ones that are less dense from water from the ones that are more dense from water. Any questions? Okay. Oh, yes. This will be important in the density level. Excuse me. Should we see That's more fun than I probably need to show. But anyway, this is the original Indiana Jones movie. And uh, I told you there's going to be lots of bad movie references. I apologize. But anyway, in this movie, he wanted to get this gold idol. All right. And so obviously there were pressure traps and stuff like that. So we tried to gauge the sand, how much it would be relative to gold. But we just saw how gold is one of the most dense substances known. There's probably a lot more mass in that idol than he put uh, in terms of mass of sand. So the tomb wasn't full and start to kill him. And anyway, it's a fun movie. You don't have to watch the movie to get an A in this class or anything, but it is kind of a fun movie if you haven't seen it. Uh, questions on that? Good. Uh, <clears throat> so here's another question. Uh, we've got, uh, let's say you're uh, maybe water skiing or something like that, and you're using some rope, polypropylene rope, all right? And it floats on the water if you drop it accidentally, which makes sense because you don't want the rope to sink to the bottom, right? On the other hand, if you have a bottle uh, made from a plastic uh, soda bottle, a lot of times those will sink made from teller phthalate polymer, which is kind of crazy. So the question is here, what's the order of increasing density, all right? Now, <clears throat> increasing means go from the smallest to the biggest, all right? So does the less, least dense material, will it float on the top or will it sink to the bottom? Float. Float at the top, well done. In this case then, the rope, all right, floats, all right, which is good for the water skiers. You want that to be on the top. So the polypropylene rope will be the less dense because it floats, all right? Now, water is a player here. Water is the medium which all this stuff is being compared. One part will float, one part will sink. So water is going to be in the middle then, and that puts the soda bottle then at the very bottom. <clears throat> so this would be the most dense, this would be the least dense. It's kind of cool how it works out. They use this for recycling sometimes. This kind of stuff. Questions? All right. 
Now, another really cool use for this is to use the density to convert how much volume of a substance you have or how much mass that you have. On Monday, I talked about converting, for example, quarters to dollars or dollars to quarters. And we used four quarters per dollar to figure out that eight quarters was two dollars, or if you reverse it, two dollars was eight quarters, all right? Well, density is just another one of these kind of conversion factors, all right? Instead of four quarters per dollar, our densities are going to look like grams per centimeter cubed, which isn't as much fun as thinking about quarters of dollars, I know, but it's super helpful when it comes to chemists. If chemists have so much volume, you can use the density to figure out how much mass you have. On the other hand, if you have so much mass of a substance like copper, you can figure out how much volume you have using the density. But first, you have to have the density. So in this problem, we have a piece of copper, excuse me, 57.54 grams, and it's definitely like a rectangle, all right? It's 9.36 centimeters long, it's 7.23 centimeters wide, and it's 0.95 millimeters thick. So it's basically like a long sheet with not a lot of depth to it. Well, we can use this information to calculate the density of copper metal. And we're gonna use for the units here, grams per centimeter cubed. So in this calculation, the mass will go on the top, and that's easy, we got that right there, 57.54. In the bottom, we need the volume in centimeters cubed. And remember, centimeters cubed is like length times width times height. Well, length, width, and height. So in theory, multiply times this times this, and we'd be good to go. But there's one more thing we have to do here. What is that? Convert to millimeters. Convert to millimeters. We need to get millimeters out into centimeters. So this is a metric problem as well. So what we're gonna do in this problem, we're gonna turn the millimeters into centimeters first. So we've got that good to go. Then we're gonna go width times length times height. That'll give us the volume in centimeters cubed. And then finally, we'll put the mass on the top of the volume to calculate the density. So let's do it. 10 millimeters are in one centimeter. All right, uh, that, so if you want to convert millimeters to centimeters, divide this by 10, 0 0.095 centimeters would be the length in centimeters. We need centimeters because the density needs to be in centimeters cubed. And a centimeter cubed is centimeters times centimeters times centimeters. You can't do centimeters times centimeters times millimeters. So once we have this, the volume will be length times width times height, all right? All of these in centimeters, no millimeters. So centimeter times centimeter times centimeter is a centimeter cube. I'm gonna use 6.4 here. Your calculator will give you a different number. We'll talk on Friday what's going on there. But for right now, if you get this number, that's awesome. And just realize for something we'll talk about on Friday, I'm gonna cut it down a little bit. And then finally, the density will be the mass, which is just the grams, divided by the volume that we calculated, 9.0 grams per centimeter cube. So that's the density of copper, all right? Don't worry about these numbers right now. We'll talk about that on Friday, what's going on. But I do wanna show you how to calculate the density. So you make some kind of brand new substance X, no one's ever studied it before, no problem. You can figure out the mass pretty easy. We'll use a scale, see that next week. Find the volume, there's different ways to find the volume. In this case, we use length times width times height. Mass over volume, got the density, good to go. If the density of water is about one gram per centimeter cube, will the copper float or sink in the water? Sink. Sink. Definitely. And besides, if you just like, duh, I've seen copper and stuff sink, um, this number is bigger than the one gram per centimeter cube that water has. So things that have a bigger density go to the bottom, and things that have smaller densities go to the top. So that polypropylene rope we talked about earlier, I think its density is like 0.8, 
something like that. So that's why it floats on the water. Uh, it, but uh, this is definitely more dense. And stuff. Any questions? Okay, I think this is a good place to stop. Uh, really glad to have you here. If you have any questions, let me know. Email me and stuff like that. This stuff is due on Monday. Have a good day. Really glad to have you here. Thanks for being here.